Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Bornbach. I've never given a lecture before. Um, so since I'm going to sit and talk about my own movies for a while in conversation, I, I thought I'd uh, start by talking a little bit about other people's movies. Um, Mike Nichols said about directors speculating on how other directors do their job is how all the rest of us uh, think about sex, which is, does everybody do it this way? <laughs> I'd also wanted to focus in particular on the beginnings of certain movies, uh, the opening sequences, the sort of, you know, the way we're first introduced to the characters, to the story, and how you know, directors and, and writers choose to begin. Um, I think as many uh, filmmakers are in the audience as you, that you know that this is something we're tasked with inventing all of the time. Um, my friend Brian De Palma, who, who is also the subject of a documentary I made, uh, emphasizes that it's your only chance to introduce the audience to your characters and to your movie. This is your opportunity to do anything you want. And a director must take this responsibility very seriously. He said, think about how many movies start with generic aerial shots of the city. Why would you blow this opportunity? <laughs> with drones, this is even easier now to, to do. Um, but then you think about the opening of The Shining, where the aerial shots say everything. Those gliding images with that music, that strange, haunting feeling. So, of course, there are no rules. Or when we make them for ourselves, we need to know when to break them. Greta Gerwig pointed out to me that my movies tend to tell you what they're about at the very beginning. I wasn't aware of this. <laughs> but it's embarrassing when <laughs> you go back and look. Uh, Mom and me versus you and dad is the opening line of the squid and the whale. <laughs> um, um, in Greenberg, Greta Gerwig herself says to the unseen car in the lane next to her while she's trying to merge, are you going to let me in? Interestingly, when I was doing press for Greenberg, an interviewer pointed out this line to me and that it told the whole story of the movie and of her and Ben Stiller's characters that the movie was about letting people in. And I started to cry. <laughs> because I had never thought about it this way. <laughs> Honestly, I just thought she was changing lanes. <laughs> so as filmmakers, we're aware of some things and not of others. And I'd like to keep it this way, if I may. I find in general that if you're successful in telling the story, the other things take care of themselves. I pick four movies and beginnings that I that I love. I mean, they're movies that I love, um, but they're also particular or special to me because of the ways that I came to them of when I first saw them. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of clips. And um, the first is from Jules and Jim, directed by Francois Truffaut. Uh, and the second is from Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese. Uh, and uh, this is how both movies open. So. Um, I'm supposed to make this very obvious. So now we should play the clips. <laughs> On the <laughs> Tu m'as dit je t'aime. Je t'ai dit attends. J'allais dire prends-moi. Tu m'as dit va-t'en.
C'était vers 1912. Jules étranger à Paris avait demandé à Jim qu'il connaissait à peine de le faire entrer au bal des Khadzars. Jim lui avait procuré une carte et l'avait amené chez le costumier. C'est pendant que Jules fouillait doucement parmi les étoffes et se choisissait un simple costume d'esclave que naquit l'amitié de Jim pour Jules. Elle grandit pendant le bal où Jules fut tranquille avec des yeux comme des boules, pleins d'humour et de tendresse. Le lendemain, ils eurent leur première vraie conversation, puis ils se virent tous les jours. Chacun enseignait à l'autre jusque tard dans la nuit sa langue et sa littérature. Ils se montraient leurs poèmes et les traduisaient ensemble. Ils avaient aussi en commun une relative indifférence envers l'argent et ils causaient sans hâte, aucun des deux n'ayant jamais trouvé un auditeur si attentif. Jules n'avait pas de femme dans sa vie parisienne et il en souhaitait une. Jim en avait plusieurs. Il lui fit rencontrer une jeune musicienne, le début sembla favorable, Jules fut un peu amoureux une semaine et elle aussi, puis ce fut un joli bout de femme désinvolte qui tenait le coup dans les cafés mieux que les poètes jusqu'à 6 heures du matin. Une autre fois ce fut une jolie veuve toute blonde, ils eurent des sorties à trois, elle déconcertait Jules qu'elle trouvait gentil mais ballot et amena pour lui une amie placide mais Jules la trouva placide. Enfin, malgré l'avis de Jim, Jules prit contact avec des professionnels, mais sans y trouver satisfaction. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Um, there's a scene in um, a movie I made called While We're Young, where um, uh, a character played by Ben Stiller is giving a lecture. This. I had to imagine this because, I, as I told you, I've never given a lecture before. And uh, he has a PowerPoint presentation, and it stops working, and he tries to figure it out. And we tried to get some laughs that way. Um, I, I now know that experience um, <laughs> because the, I, in, in my dream of this moment, it would play through the entire montage at the beginning of Goodfellas. So, um, but there was some f breakdown in the communication, so you only got that first part. <laughs> that first part doesn't really relate to Jules and Jim as much as the part that comes after. <laughs> um, but it's probably on YouTube. Maybe someone could get it up on their phone and pass it around and could, uh, and maybe you guys remember it. Tony Bennett sings, I go from rags to riches, and he's, after he says, I want to be a gangster, we see him as a kid. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always great when people talk movies. Um, well, I, in, in, well, in 1990, I was uh, at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. It's about two hours outside of New York City, if you don't know Poughkeepsie. It's also uh, immortalized in the French Connection, where he says, do you pick your toes in Poughkeepsie? Um, Uh, I grew up with parents who loved movies, who sometimes wrote about movies, and who introduced me to many kinds of movies. But it wasn't until college that I began to truly appreciate international cinema. It was at Vassar that I saw Jules and Jim for the first time. And it's great when you see, I imagine people, the audience have had this feeling, hopefully many times, but it's great when you're younger and you see the right movie at the right time. Um, I felt elated when I saw that movie from the very beginning of that montage. And it seemed so contemporary to me. The ideas of friendship were very relatable to me, although the specifics were totally 
uh, out of my experience. Um, uh, and the, the, weirdly, the subtitle of prose, I thought it was uh, <laughs> P-R-O-S. Um, and the, even the central love triangle, really the main story of the movie was, it was mysterious to me and it really remains that way to me to this day. But none of that matters because the movie had such feeling and such energy. And I've returned to it many times over the years and it's meant different things to me every time I see it. And if pressed to say my favorite movie, which is always an annoying question, um, uh, just because I never feel like I'm going to do, do it right uh, for myself. But I will often say Jules and Jim. I'll also say E.T. <laughs> the same week, I went to the Poughkeepsie Galleria, which was a mall 30 minutes from school where we'd go to see new movies. And I saw the new Martin Scorsese movie, Goodfellas. And it blew me out of my seat. And as a teenager, in the 1980s, I was discovering a lot of great artists from the 70s and the 60s, and before that, often on VHS. Um, that's where I, I was told I should take a moment to explain what VHS is. <laughs> um, before it came out of the sky, <laughs> you had to put tapes and things to play things. Um, you could record on them, you could record for six hours, but the quality was terrible. Um, my, uh, my, my parents got divorced. My father w was seeing a, 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 dating a woman who lived in Manhattan, which was very glamorous for all of us, um, and f for many reasons, but in Manhattan, they had cable. Again, for those of you, before it came out of the sky, <laughs> it came from under the earth. Uh, but in Brooklyn, we had no cable. They didn't give us cable. <laughs> now Brooklyn is everything. Everyone loves Brooklyn. But then there was the, the, we, we weren't worthy of cable. So she would record things on these six-hour extended play tapes. And they would just, she'd just run it on Showtime. On it, and then my father would bring them back, and we'd be so excited. And we would get things. I actually put this in the Meyerowitz story as a version of this. But we would get things like Gorillas in the Mist, Scanners, you know, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop. It would just, it, it, so we would have these sort of triple shows that made no sense, except it was just what they ran on, on the thing. That's a digression. Um, <laughs> but often, these filmmakers that I was discovering from the past, when I would see their new movies or things, you know, that, 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 that were coming out currently in the, in the movie theater, it, it sometimes wasn't considered their best. And I always felt like, oh, I was born too late. I, I, I'm not getting the best moment of this stuff. You know, I'm, you know my bond was Roger Moore. Um, uh, my Rolling Stones was the album Dirty Work, which I, doesn't get much of a laugh because nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, um, but here in Poughkeepsie, I was seeing a classic in real time. My Scorsese was Goodfellas. And in Poughkeepsie, I felt like Truffaut and Scorsese were speaking to each other in some way. Because if you'd seen the rest of the clip, uh, <laughs> this would make a lot more sense. But um, so, because he tells the story similarly in the rest of the clip, um, uh, in, in that it's, but it's with Henry Hill's voiceover instead of this sort of omniscient narrator of Jules and Jim. And it has, uh, it tells you very deliberately what is going on. Um, and I would just like to add, as a matter of fact checking, that when I moderated Martin Scorsese's DGA screening a few weeks ago and I brought this up to him, his response was, Goodfellas is the opening sequence of Jules and Jim for two hours. I feel in both these sequences, the excitement of having the idea is expressed in the execution of it. And this is one of my favorite feelings in movies, and something I get often from both Truffaut and Scorsese. Uh, my friend Wes Anderson does this as well. There's an economy and an energy in both. We're introduced to the characters in a very direct way, as I pointed out, the, 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 the use of the voiceover is, is, is musical. Um, we're told Jules and Jim became friends. It's, there's no question about it. We're told I always wanted to be a gangster. It's, it's, it's not ambiguous. The sequences are almost complete in their way, like short films, but 
they suggest so much more to come. Uh, particularly in Scorsese's movie, the, the scene you did see with, in the car. <laughs> the accordion player is not supposed to come to <laughs> for another five minutes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the scene that we see in the car is mysterious, it's thrilling, it's violent, it's horrible. You know, and we also come back to that scene in a new context later, so it means something to us uh, differently later. Um, but there's also the thing of being in such, they're like announcing themselves as well, that you feel in such great hands. We all have that, that experience in movies where, I, I, I particularly don't like this in horror movies, uh, where I, if I don't feel like I'm in good hands, I. I and I have that feeling that anything could happen in this movie at any time, but in the worst way, because I feel taken advantage of, I feel manipulated, versus when you're with a director where you feel like anything could happen in this movie, and I love that feeling, because I, I will go anywhere with this person. I, watching these sequences feels physical to me. I mean, when I, when I look at them, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of participating in them. It's the way my father used to be, where you sit on the couch watching Nick games. He would always kind of do this like wiggle with the, with the action of the thing. And I feel that way watching these sequences. It's so important too, because what the, the, the movies uh, are about is how this visceral, giddy, propulsive feeling can't last, last forever. It's fleeting. Um, in Jules and Jim, it's innocence, youth, early friendship, early love. In Goodfellas, it's the rush of success, power. Um, I always think this movie is as much about success as it is about the mob. It's the party and then what comes afterwards. I'd also just to say also about the music uh, in Jules and Jim, George Delarue's score uh, is such an important part of it. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll talk about later for Marriage Story, um, you know, Randy Newman and I listened to a lot of George Delarue, and we looked at a lot of sequences, particularly in Truffaut movies, because of the way he uses it. In, in Francis Ha, I used many of these scores, actually used the scores uh, as a, a kind of collage to create a similar feeling of exhilaration. The music is big, it's beautiful, it's romantic, it's melancholy. Um, it doesn't underscore the scenes or push for feeling, it reacts. It almost springs out of the movie itself, and it plays the bigness of feeling. It gives a sense of both present and past tense, and the editing, the energy, I feel like is what feels so present and, uh, in, in these sequences, but the music makes it feel like past, and there's something very sad about that. I think, well, why don't we look at the, uh, there's two other uh, clips of openings that it also like to talk uh, to introduce and talk about one the the first one is from uh, blue velvet uh directed by david lynch and the second is from movie trouble in paradise directed by ernst lubitsch so let's play those two clips now please <laughs> She wore blue velvet, bluer than velvet was the night, softer than satin was the light from the stars. She wore blue Love was ours I love I held tightly Feeling the rapture grow Like flames burning brightly What went to Gone was the glow Bye. 
divieto di venire qui a incontrare un signore. Mm, le tue solite storie. Yes, Baron. What shall we start with, Baron? Hmm? Oh, yes. That's not so easy. Beginnings are always difficult. Yes, Baron. If Casanova suddenly turned out to be Romeo, having supper with Juliet, who might become Cleopatra, how would you start? I would start with cocktails. Mm-hmm. Very good. Excellent. It must be the most marvelous supper. We may not eat it, but it must be marvelous. Yes, Baron. Uh, in 1986, my friend Bo and I took the subway into Manhattan from Brooklyn and saw Blue Velvet at the Waverly Theater in Greenwich Village. I fabricated this episode in The Squid and the Whale. Uh, in that movie, uh, Jeff Daniels plays father, chaperones his son in a date to go see Blue Velvet, because I imagined it would be uncomfortable. Um, and David Lynch was very kind in lending me the, uh, the clip from Blue Velvet, if you've seen the movie, um, uh, Isabella Rossellini um, is naked and uh, bloody and says he put his disease in me. And then Laura Dern gives a kind of indescribable, it's almost, it's like an inhalation and an exhalation at the same time in reaction. And, uh, uh, I realized recently, actually, that that was my first um, collaboration with Laura Dern. Um, and I, all the time, had been thinking that Marriage Story was the first time. But um, again, it came when an interviewer asked me about it. And I said, no, that was Laura Linney. And she said, no, but in the blue velvet. Anyway, so that made the, um, I didn't cry in this interview. Um, as, as I said before, this was a time when I was discovering great movies and, and, and a lot of directors from the past, but I was also lucky enough to be seeing these amazing new filmmakers of the moment in the theater. Uh, David Lynch, Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee, the Coen brothers, Alex Cox, Jane Campion. It was a really exciting time for me to be discovering uh, uh, movies. And... Um, you know, I, I think they, the, the sequences speak for themselves. They're very clear in certain ways. I mean, the Blue Velvet uh, clip, you start with something sort of familiar and something we've seen a version of before, um, and then, but something is off and unfamiliar. Um, you know, and then, of course, we go even underneath uh, to this kind of horrifying, disgusting bug life. Um, and it puts you in a mood for what's to come. Although, what's to come in Blue Velvet is totally unpredictable. Um, but it also expresses how these things live side by side all of the time. Um, in college, I took a screwball comedy class 
which uh, was 30, comedies of the 30s and 40s, which had a huge impact on me. And I saw movies by Preston Sturges and Howard Hawks and Leo McCary and Frank Capra and Ernst Lubitsch, who directed Trouble in Paradise. And I'd never heard about Trouble in Paradise. I, I, didn't, even, I didn't know who the actors were. Uh, Herbert Marshall, who plays the Baron, Miriam Hopkins, who we see briefly uh, playing the uh, ukulele in the um, uh, gondola, Kay Francis, all wonderful actors, but not well known, at least uh, in 1980s. Um, uh, and my teacher, Jim Stearman, because you were, we were in a learning environment, they would point out these things to you, uh, pointed out the genius of starting with the trash gondola. And it immediately reminded me of Blue Velvet at the time, which I had seen already. Um, and, you know, setting you up right away for this idea that nothing is exactly what it seems. And beneath the, the surface, a, a kind of glossy surface, uh, there's a darker underbelly. And that these things are ever present and live together always. Um, but at the same time, both these movies are so inviting. Um, I mean, I, I, all four of these clips, you can't stop watching. I mean, if we could, we could just watch all of them. Um, and rather than talk, I'd actually rather watch the clips. Um, but um, Lubitsch is, I, I find, a really one of the best directors, um, I mean, ever. And uh, I drew upon a lot from Lubitsch uh, for Marriage Story. Um, his blocking, particularly his camera movement, which you saw some of there, um, the notion of performance. Um, often his characters are performing in some way, which you, you learn about that character. To Be or Not To Be, another great one that he did is about a theater company in Nazi Germany. Um, there's also often a sense of facade, um, but mostly his incredible energy. So I, I mean, I picked these clips just as a way of introduction and a way to sort of talk about, even to get into talking about my movies because I, I feel like those are really exciting moments in, in life when you start to see connections or, or invisible conversations between works of art from different time periods. Um, and these four were particularly illuminating for me at the time um, when I was growing up. And I feel like unfortunately this happens less frequently as an adult. Um, but when I watch movies by these filmmakers, it brings me back to that sense of discovery. And as a creative person, that's the kind of headspace I want to be in as much as possible. I'm going to now show you the opening of my new movie, Marriage Story. And um, afterwards, we'll, we'll have a conversation and um, talk about that movie and perhaps some others. The clip should be shown now. <laughs> what I love about Nicole, she makes people feel comfortable about even embarrassing things. Hey, you look like you care about animals. Yes, I do. She really listens when someone is talking. Um, like, you know what, I, it's funny, I actually signed up for the story, but I never heard from you guys. Sometimes she listens too much for too long. She's a good citizen. Just call him. I'm not calling. She always knows the right thing to do when it comes to oh, difficult no. family shit. Call him. I get stuck in my ways, and she knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. She cuts all our hair. She's always inexplicably brewing a cup of tea that she doesn't drink. And it's not easy for her to put away a sock or close a cabinet or do a dish, but she tries for me. Nicole grew up in LA around actors and directors and movies and TV and is very close to her mother, Sandra, and Cassie, her sister.
Nicole gives great presents. She is a mother who plays, really plays. She never steps off playing or says it's too much. And it must be too much some of the time. She's amazing at opening jars because of her strong arms, which I've always found very sexy. She keeps the fridge over full. No one is ever hungry in our house. She can drive a stick. How could you? After that movie, All Over the Girl, she could have stayed in LA and been a movie star, but she gave that hey, up to Trish. do theater with me in New York. You might as well get what you paid for. She's brave. She's a great dancer, infectious. She makes me wish I could dance. She always says when she doesn't know something or hasn't read a book or seen a film or a play, or as I fake it or say something like I haven't seen that in a while. My crazy ideas are her favorite things to figure out how to execute. Let's try it. Crawling. Also stand. She's my favorite actress. No, that was fantastic. I, um, I kind of feel like I just want to listen to you talk more. Is that <laughs> permissible? Uh, well, if, yes, if you ask me direct questions, I'll talk. Fine, let's do that. And we won't queue up anymore. No, we are going to queue some more clips, aren't we? Right, we have yeah, more to we show. Have more yep. clips. Um, it was fascinating listening to you talk just now. It put me in mind of a couple of years I spent teaching English. And at that point, in terms of teaching young children to put one sentence in front of the other, it felt like there were two ways to do that. You could either teach them grammatical devices and teach them from the blackboard, or what turned out to be much more effective, you could throw a pile of fascinating books at them, which they would never have heard of otherwise, and they would make their way through them, and they would become people who were comfortable and kind of you know, joyous with language. It sounds a little bit like you were doing both at the start of your career, but it was veering towards the latter. It was veering towards just bumping into a huge amount of great films. Yeah, well, I had, I had the, the sort of luxury, but also the challenge, I would say, of having parents who were cinephiles and who were, would put these movies in front of me, often movies too, too early. Like, I, that's what I was saying about Jules and Jim. Like, I, I had seen other uh, French movies or Italian movies in high school, and I kind of knew I was supposed to like them. I knew they were, but I didn't, I, I just couldn't get there yet. And I, I always feel like, I, and this still happens with certain filmmakers, or where I, I'll kind of revisit them every few years with that hope that something is going to open up. And it's not, it's American directors too. I mean, I, I, I you know, like John Ford, I've, I've like I know he's a great director. I, I've, I'm still waiting to be <laughs> to, to to totally enter in. Not not all of his. Movies. I love um, uh, my darling Clementine and um, uh, the Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. But those are, are for whatever reason are more accessible to me than The Searchers, which uh, you know I, I I know is to be great, but I haven't yet had that feeling of its greatness. And I think. You know, but it's exciting when those when that happens. When those, like you say, it is like learning a new language. I, I Eric Romer, um, I was just in Paris yesterday, so I was trying to say Romer, uh, but you said Romer the second time. Uh, what's that? You said Romer the second Romer, time. Romer, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, um, but uh, Eric Romer <laughs> in America, <laughs> I I couldn't. I saw a couple of his movies. I saw, I think, I saw a movie of his in college, and and. And I saw a new movie of his right out of college, and I, I, I really struggled with them. And then it was at a film festival, it was a retrospective of his at, at the Film Forum in New York. And I decided to give it another chance. I think it was in my late 20s. And, and, and I, it was like a drug. I kept going back. I kept, I, I, and I felt like I was learning a new language, so much so that there was actually, when Pauline at the Beach, which they were showing them relative, sort of in order, and that one's in the 80s, and I, it, when it came, I, it, they, 
they had shipped a print without subtitles. And it didn't matter. I felt like I knew, I, I mean, I speak some French, but it, I, I, I felt like I was so inside the movies now and his rhythms and his, and, um, and, and now he's one of my favorite filmmakers. I wonder, is that, do you think, a, just a, a, a result of getting older and actually watching more films, or is that a result of becoming a filmmaker and actually knowing, the, knowing the, that world from the inside out? I don't know that being a filmmaker has a lot to do with it, because when a movie connects, it connects viscerally and emotionally. It's not, I'm not thinking about, usually if I'm thinking about how a movie was made, it's because I'm not, it, it's not a very good movie or it's not a movie I, 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 I'm responding to. Um, I think, I mean, certainly age helps, um, experience helps, but, but I think it can also just be timing. It's, you know, you could maybe, if you didn't get it on a Tuesday, you could get it on Wednesday. Right. We're here to talk about script writing specifically, so I want to talk about you as a filmmaker, but I mean, in, in terms of script writing, I wonder what kind of writer you are. Are you the kind of writer who is happy with the first draft when something delights you on every page and when every scene sings to you, or, or is it a question of getting to the point where nothing appalls you and makes you actually want to shoot yourself? Is anybody like the first part of that? Maybe, they, I mean, people um, raise their hands. Uh, so. <laughs> I, the idea of everything delighting me is so they can, uh, um, uh, but that's why I keep trying, <laughs> looking for that moment. Well, I, I, when I think about script writing, it really is intertwined with directing for me, I, 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 and editing too. I really do experience the whole process as one. And I don't, um, and, and, we, and, we, and, and I wanna talk about screenwriting, but I, I, I'm, but I do, I, I, I I do find a script that's, that isn't a movie um, of, of my own uh, somewhat useless. Like I don't think, I don't find, I don't, I don't think scripts, maybe some are somewhere, but I don't think they're complete things. They're by nature potential. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, they've been called blueprints or, you know, um, uh, and some directors use them very much as just guides that, you know, Robert Altman, you know, would kind of make an entirely new movie out of the script he was given. I follow my scripts uh, quite closely. I'm interpreting them as a director, but I'm, I'm following we, we, the, the lines of the, of the lines and, and um, uh, the scenes of the scenes. But even so, on their own, I don't... Um, I don't get a lot of delight out of them, I guess I should say. But, but I, um, the way I work is, and I edit the way I, pretty much the way I write, which is um, often I, now anyway, I sit down to write when I kind of feel like I have enough to start and I take a lot of notes and always. And, and often there's a few different things that are sort of, going on at once and one thing kind of announces itself and that when that wire kind of like electricity goes through that wire I I try to follow it but once I have a like scenes or, or a beginning or something I tend to I tend to work forward and go back and revise and then go a little bit further and then go back and revise so by the time I'm done with the script it's close to being ready, which is the same way. I, I don't have a rough cut. I, I start at the beginning with the, my editor, Jen Lame, and we, we cut the movie. Uh, we go a little bit, and then we go back, and we revise, same thing. So that when we're done, uh, it doesn't mean we, of course we make changes throughout, but, uh, and once you see it all together, it gives you other ideas. But the, um, but it's generally in very good shape. I, I, don't, I don't sort of throw it up there roughly and then uh, that I find too disheartening, I think. It's funny, I remember going to Manhattan for the first time in the 90s and at that point I think it was that kind of Tarantino moment and you had scripts which were being sold on the streets, so you had like bootleg scripts. It doesn't sound like you were the kind of person who was seeking those out as, as sort of those almost fetishistic objects. I had never seen itself. a script um, until I wrote one and it was before final draft, you know, or any of these screenwriting um, programs, 
And my first movie, Kicking and Screaming, was the first script I'd ever seen, which is, I had to actually write it to see it. And I, I had so much trouble with the tabs getting the formatting because right. you know, it was before. <laughs> so I just, my whole experience, mental memory or emotional memory, I should say, of, of, that, um, of that process was just hitting tab and trying to center, you know, Grover with the line. And I, I, I spent so much time trying to get it to look like a script. That was the important yeah, stuff, Yeah, right? yeah, and, and yeah. And then I looked at some scripts to, just for the formatting. I had bought scripts you could buy, uh, not, not on the street, I didn't know about those, but I, um, um, I bought published scripts, but they were often, or the ones I had were all kind of transcripts of the right. finished movie. They didn't look like uh, scripts that, as, as I've now come to understand them. In terms of looking at the scenes you played just now and then finding sort of connective tissue to your work, it feels like place is a very obvious one. That, that actually, you know, whether that's Venice or whether it's Lumberton, there's this sense of place which is more than just, it's never just a location. It's right. always very much the essence of the film. And that really feels like something that you've brought through in your work as well. Yeah, and, yeah, and what's interesting about Blue Velvet is it's, it's very specific, but it's very generalized at the same time. Lumberton or Lumber, you know, it's, where is that? You know, I mean, but it seems we all know where it is, but we have no idea where it is, um, which is amazing. Um, yeah, place is a big part of it. And, I, um, and I'd like to know the place when I'm writing. Um, I mean, obviously I need to know the place for it, but I mean, I like to even have visual ideas of the streets, the, the, the locations, if I can, um, when I'm writing. Because uh, I feel like it grounds me. It's for the same reason I often use real names in my scripts of people I know, um, n not because I'm writing about them at all. I would never do that, but but, but um, because it's immediately a real person to me. I believe it. Uh, I, well, like I know that I know who Roger Greenberg is because I grew up with Roger Greenberg. Right. Um, he wasn't Roger Greenberg in Greenberg, but he. Um, because I also because I hadn't seen him since I was like 15, but but um, but I had deep affection for him and for that time in my life. And even though the movie had no literal connection to that, calling him Roger Greenberg made me love him, right. and 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 also it made it real to me. I mean, you mentioned Brooklyn in your lecture, um, and Brooklyn obviously has this pivotal role. And again, it's that sense, Brooklyn is not just a place, it's a, a source of drama, a source of a conflict sometimes. You have that relationship between Manhattan and Brooklyn, which comes up in your work. You know, yeah. now you have in Marriage Story, New York and LA, so it's less Brooklyn specific, although it is Brooklyn, but then it's also New York and it's the other coast as well. Yeah, it's also home. I think notions of home and that come up in my movie. I mean, even my first movie, Kicking and Screaming, they're by design not at home, but they're they're in college. But it's become a kind of surrogate home that they don't want to leave, and that's sort of being fixed and associated with a place, and how that can be uh, uh, that can hold you back or it can propel you forward, you know. And and you know, place and family and home. I mean, all these things then can become versions of each other. A marriage Story, New York and L.A. In some ways, become stand-ins for once the lawyers use them as arguments in their divorce, it's, they become representative of the characters themselves, you know, and, um, and that's true, but it's also not true. Yeah, we tend to think of our place as the kind of person we are, don't we, but as you say, that's but, but Brooklyn, a mistake. But Brooklyn, to what you're saying, I mean, I, I have a strong connection. To, uh, I feel like a lot of what I, I'm doing as a creative person is, is is, is a conversation or maybe a sort of silent conversation with my younger self who loved movies. I mean, I think it's why I was drawn to talk about what I talked about is that I'm always talking to that, to that person who was discovering movies for the first time and so excited about them. And so often I'm drawn to the world of, of, of that time as well, even if I'm not, Squid and the Whale was actually that time in my life, but, the, um, uh, but even when the movies take place, say, in the present, it, it's still, in some sort of cinematic way, I'm sort of still conversing with that boy. We're going to shortly queue up another clip from Francis Ha. I mean, that's a particularly fascinating thing. I want to pick up a thread, really, because Francis Ha is a film which is seen as, as not about you. It's a, you know, it's a different generation, it's a different gender, but I'd be fascinated to know in which way Greta and you kind of merge on, on the screen. So, sure. I mean, do you want to say anything about Francis Ha before we look at the clip? Well, it's I again, think it, New York is... It's it. a good... I think it's the beginning of the movie, right? So, again, well, Francis Ha also was, I, I think, 
even more directly inspired, in my mind anyway, by Jules and Jim's opening. Uh, it, and it's, you know, it is about friends, mm -hmm. and it's also about, you know, friendship as, as love, a, sort of a love story between friends, and the story, of course, is, is about that bond, but also, you know, it's a, about individuals and a pair at the same time, which marriage story is too. Um, uh, but, you know, you can show the clip and sort of see how I was sort of, you know, introducing, again, the sort of language of the movie that, that you were going to later see. Absolutely. Well, let's look at this clip from Francis. <laughs> by calling it sincere is now at best a way of saying that although it may be given no aesthetic or intellectual admiration, I should sleep in my own bed. Why? Because I bought it. Stay. But take off your socks. I haven't seen that in a while, actually. Uh, just a quick, uh, the, the world premiere of Francis Howe was at the Telluride Film Festival, which is an amazing festival. Um, we were just, we were there with Marriage Story, and I, I love it. Um, but we were premiering the movie, and, and no one knew we, we'd even made the movie, because we kind of made it sort of under the radar. And um, uh, so it was very exciting, you know, here it goes. And there was some, uh, the movie began, and there was music and picture, but I knew because there's also like a low dialogue soundtrack, you know, ambient track underneath, that wasn't playing. Uh, and and uh, but there was no way that anyone who didn't know the movie would know. So I turned to the person, the you know friendly person with the headset who was next to me, in case there was a problem, and told them you know you got to turn it off, you got to turn it. And um, just not it sort of takes the mystery and drama out of showing a movie when you're like we have to restart. Um, and so they stopped the movie sort of partly way in, and then then they few minutes and then they show it again it's the same problem again and then so then they stop it again and you're really losing the momentum of your <laughs> worldwide premiere um, but I did have to explain to people that the movie is actually in black and white right. yeah because <laughs> at that point I think they were all like good it's also the colors off so we'll get to it. Yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, uh. So third time lucky, did it? Did it play the third time it played as it was supposed to. I, of course, in my imagination, there was somebody like, oh, you know, plugging in the thing. <laughs> really, you know, that thing in movies where the, the thing's just not. But I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was more sophisticated than that. But, um, it's such a beautiful scene though, because it feels so haphazard and it feels so random. It feels like a sort of box of snapshots that you've just sort of stumbled upon, and then you realise by the end of it, you have. You've given us so much information. Information is a very unsexy word, but it's also vitally important in movie storytelling. And it's this incredibly, again, I mean, it's a high praise. It's a very functional scene. You know, you've told yeah. us a lot. Well, that's it's interesting. I mean, again, going to the clips that we looked at in the beginning, which are, I mean, they're poetry, but they're also, they're just, as you say, they're absolutely functional they really just tell the story I mean they, they I mean in that Ernst Lubitsch clip you learn so much so quickly mm -hmm. and you get the trash gondola which is like you know it's like amazing um, and 
it's, um, you know, and, and as I was saying about Goodfellas and Jules and Jim, they actually just tell you exactly what you need to know. Um, I mean, we don't use voiceover here, but, but we did, because we didn't need it, and it wasn't the style of the movie, but the, the um, but yeah, and then of course, and I'm even watching it now, looking at them fighting in the beginning, and it's a play fight, but they're fighting, and I'm like, you know, that, that of course is sort of what the movie's about too, you know. Um, uh, but, um, the, I mean, this movie was, a, in some ways, like it was as I was making it, it was a movie I, I, I needed to make, and, but almost didn't know it. I, I wanted to make a movie in a different way than I had before, and, and in a sense, I, I felt like I wanted to make the first film I had, uh, my first film all over again, or a fil first film I never did make. And, and I was also exploring working digitally for the first time, which, I mean, I've since gone back to film. Marriage Story is shot on film. Meyerwood Story is before it was shot on film. Um, but I, I wanted to, to shoot with a very small crew and kind of not, the sort of notion of like, we don't need to tell anybody. Why do you always have to like tell everyone you're making a movie? Let's just go make something, you know? If, if, you know, we, the conversation we're having right now could be in the movie if we were recording it and filming it. So let's just do that. And Greta and I wrote this script, but it really did, I think also shooting in black and white, sort of going to your sense of place. I was shooting in New York again. I had shot Greenberg in LA before, so I was coming back to New York. And I think seeing New York with kind of fresh eyes, literally in a different, with no color, in a, in a different way, and in a different medium with digital instead of, it, it, it freed other things up, even in the storytelling and in the, um, and, and I love that about making movies because it's sort of what I was saying too about the things you know and the things you don't. And if you, I find more and more if you focus on the storytelling, the, the really, uh, the sort of what you're saying, the functionality of things, then you'll back into some more magical or, 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 uh, you know, things that can be misconstrued as profound. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's a very good uh, I mean, was the writing process a, a kind of a question of relearning as well? Because uh, filmmaking is collaboration, of course, but I mean, writing, at least at first draft stage, isn't. I mean, writing, if you're writing solo, you know, you're there, you are for that moment the executive, but here you're collaborating with Greta from the, from the, from the word go with the script. I mean, how much of a change did that represent for you? Well, I had collaborated with Wes Anderson on the movies that he directed, but this was the first time I collaborated with somebody where I was directing it and um, yeah it was it was it, but it, it, it's less lonely um, for sure um, and what's nice about it is it is about conversation although Greta and I weren't in the same place very often when we wrote Francis Ha uh, um, we were a lot of it was done individually and then emailed back and forth and then we would revise each other's and then I would sort of collect this bigger script as a whole and we would and start putting it together. Um, uh, it's funny because it is, I mean, I get asked the question a lot about, you know, about autobiography and my movies and the one I get asked the least is, I mean, you, you were alluding to this, I think, in your introduction to it, if the, the one I get asked the least about is Francis Ha because people don't see me as a 27-year-old female, um, uh, but it actually, I, I, I think a lot about, it. there's a lot of how I, you know, I, I went through a period after I made, I made two movies when I was quite young. I made Kicking and Screaming when I was 24, 25, and then a movie Mr. Jealousy when I was 27. And then I didn't make another movie till I was 34 or something, or 34, 35 with Squid and the Whale. And that period for me was a period of, of real struggle. And it, in my sort of conscious mind, I was, I was just trying to get another movie made. I was writing things, trying to get another movie made. What I was doing unconsciously uh, was growing up. And, and I felt very much like, I mean, Frances talks at some point, someone says, what do you do? And she goes, well, it's hard to describe. And they say, why? She goes, because I don't really do it. And I felt that way. I had made two movies, but I didn't feel like I could call myself a filmmaker because I wasn't doing it. 
and I wanted to do it again, but I wasn't doing it. And it was a, it was a very hard time. And, and I, I emotionally reflected a lot on that time from, from my point of view. I mean, so much of Greta's in the movie too, obviously. Um, but, um, uh, you know, in, in that sort of, you know, what, what I guess they call quarter life uh, uh, crisis. It's, no, it's just fascinating hearing you talk, because also, I mean, I think people do think of Francis Hart as, as Greta's film, but from what you're saying, it almost feels as if there's a timeless quality, both to the change in Brooklyn and also to, you know, Greta at 27, then there is still part of you at 27, a little further down the line. Yeah. And it's so culturally specific. It's about, you know, and while we're young, is, is the same thing happens there. More Very so culturally specific about, about Brooklyn now. But from what you're saying, Although still... with Francis, I feel like it, it is culturally specific, you're right, but it is be, part of the choice to do it in black and white was to put it out of time, too. Right. And while we're young is more, I feel like, in, to, in time, uh, it, it culturally specific, and it's, um, and, and maybe even has some limitations because of that. Um, Francis, I do feel like, it, and also the use of the music, it is all George Delarue music, in the, in the, there's some other songs that we, there's a Paul McCartney, there's David Bowie's Modern Love that she runs mm -hmm. to. Um, but uh, it, it was all by design to kind of, I felt in a way to sort of, uh, to honor her, you know, that, that you have this, you know, in, in, in a certain sense, an ordinary life. Uh, and I, but for all of us living it, it's extraordinary. And I wanted the movie to kind of, to, to, to react in kind and, and give back to her. And that's what that music does. We've got another clip of, of Marriage Story to look at, but I wonder, just before we, we play it, because it speaks to this point, I mean, did the character of Francis and also working with Greta, did it improve you as a writer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if for no other reason, I was just trying to impress her. I, I, I um, <laughs> She would send me scenes, and I'd be like, oh, "Boy, this is so good!" It was so, it was like so exciting, um, you know, to the point that you know, you'd, I'd just like, if I knew maybe a scene was coming, I would just be like refreshing email, hoping that it would come through. Um, it, yeah, it 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 um, it would always, I'd, I was always made me feel good if she like liked what I sent her, and or and um, or laughed at a thing or something like that, and. Um, but it's, it, so certainly on those movies, but it, I think it, 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 I know it has, I've improved, um, I've improved as a human being because of her, but I've improved as a, as a writer and director, at least in my eyes, um, uh, from watching her, from working with her and watching her and watching her movies now too. Let's pick up this thread after this next clip from Marriage Story. We can accept an imperfect dad. Let's face it, the idea of a good father was only invented like 30 years ago. Before that, fathers were expected to be silent and absent and unreliable and selfish. And we can all say we want them to be different. But on some basic level, we accept them. We love them for their fallibilities, but people absolutely don't accept those same failings in mothers. We don't accept it structurally, and we don't accept it spiritually, because the basis of our Judeo-Christian whatever is Mary, mother of Jesus, and she's perfect. She's a virgin who gives birth, unwaveringly supports her child and holds his dead body when he's gone. And the dad isn't there. He didn't even do the fucking. God is in heaven. God is the Father, and God didn't show up. So you have to be perfect, and Charlie can be a fuck up, and it doesn't matter. You will always be held to a different, higher standard. And it's fucked up, but that is the way it is. Do you have the do you want to show the screenplay clip? Um, well, let's just pick up okay. the conversation here because I think it's worth saying, actually. It's interesting. You, you applauded then. I mean, I think when the film's been on the festival circuit for the last few months, I mean, there has been quite a lot of spontaneous applause at that scene in particular. Um, I mean, I wonder, do you feel like you could have written that without having co-written Francis Half Earth? Uh, probably not. I mean, I, I... Also, without knowing Laura was playing it, I, 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 I a lot of... The impetus for that scene came 
from talking to Laura because I, 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 Laura and Adam and Scarlett I'd had I, I, involved in the movie even before I was writing it. Um, and one thing that I was talking to Laura about in playing this character, which if you haven't seen the movie, is a divorce lawyer. Um, and was, and we were talking about it even from an actor's perspective of, of like what, 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 what got her into this job in the first place? So what is, what is you know, you, it wasn't always, uh, you know, Machiavellian or, you know, or, or uh, you, know, she, you know, she's obviously very good at working within the system and the system is Kafkaesque in a, in a way. Um, not to quote the squid and the whale, <laughs> but um, it so it was this sort of notion of that she got into it to crusade f for people and for women in particular, and uh, so that was kind of the thought. Like, and I thought, well, then we should hear that. That should come forward. Um, and working on that scene with Laura was amazing too, because there were so many ways to envision it. Like, and I would. You know, just say, you know, like, why don't you say it now like you're having these ideas more for the first time? Why don't you say it now like it's prepared? Why don't you try it now like you get angrier as you tell it? You know, and one is that it's almost cathartic as you're, you know, and, and, and she could just dial it in and out. And, and um, so it was, it was, you know, that's just one of those sort of fun days at work. But Greta is very much in that too. I mean, I mean, I think in, in, in writing it too, it was like I would talk to her about it as well and throughout this whole movie and, and you know, I mean, we were very much involved in each other's work, even the ones that we're not uh, uh, working on, you know, officially together, we're, we're always very involved in each other's work. In terms of your relationship with, with actors, how much of a joy is it for you to almost just in the second, relinquish control to them. Because obviously you can control what's on the page, but then once once it's with an actor, it can't help but become something different. I mean, is that a pleasure for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I actually find that, I mean, in some ways, working with actors is not dissimilar to what I was saying about writing, uh, in that if you get the basics right, you know, the, again, the storytelling, the efficiency, the, you know, not, the, 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 a sequence, um, other things start to reveal themselves in, in the work and suddenly you see, oh, that's in there too. Well, now I can detour a little here because I've got this, you've got the framework, you have the structure, I can now do this little aside and this little thing here and, and maybe, break, like I said, break a rule here. Um, and I find that that's, it, it, for me in, in, in a way, the, I mean, Elia Kazan always talked about being a prop but you know, people would say, you know, talk about what a good director he was with actors. He said, I'm a prop director. You know, I come up with good props for them and things for them to do, and that gives them ideas and it, it opens them up. And I, and I and I know what he means. I mean, I think giving them a framework and a structure. Um, uh, you know, all the scenes are are um, are very blocked out, and we we have it really down to every little moment. And the dialogue is all precise, but then, just as you say, then they, I feel like it gives them all the freedom in the world to, to be present, to be, just be in the, you know, to, to, to find the truth of what's going on and find their truth. And, and working with actors like this, too, who are alive to every, everything that's different in the moment and everything different that they give if it, they're in a scene with somebody else. Um, uh, even if they're off camera, you know they'll change based on the reaction that they're getting. You know, Adam Driver in the movie, you, you know, will, you know, he'll say, "We'll do a few takes," and I'll be feeling pretty good. And then he'll say, "You know, I'm, I'm going to try it not crossing my legs this time." And I know to him that means something else is going to happen. Yeah, it's because he's changing his reality and changing his physical posture. It's it, it's all. You know, he's so he's so aware of how all of these things factor into performance, and um, and I try to give actors as much of that as I can, or that I think of. You know, and I might say to an actor, maybe don't cross your legs, or maybe stand up this time because I feel like you know it'll change something. You know, and that's exciting, and I, and I do relate it to writing in that way. 
no one's sadder than I to have to do this, but we're, going to, we're out of time. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, but please, Noah Bombach. Thank you. Thank you.